The following episode describes acts of violence and murder. Listener discretion is advised. It's around 9 in the morning, November 8, 1989. A heavy fog across central Massachusetts is finally lifting, and a tragedy begins to reveal itself. Michael Grecian, a retired construction worker, is traveling along Chocolog Road in Uxbridge when he spots a large object along the road, opposite of the Route 146 southbound exit ramp. As Grecian gets closer, he discovers it's an open sleeping bag, and it appears something is packed inside of it. Grecian quickly drives off to alert town police and returns within minutes with officers. Police roll back the front of the sleeping bag to find the body of 17-year-old Jessica Jones inside. Jessica had been beaten to death and stabbed multiple times. Her body was stuffed inside the sleeping bag and dumped along Chocolog Road. Nearly 35 years later, Jessica's murder remains unsolved. The Route 146 exit ramp along Chocolog Road in Uxbridge is roughly 20 miles south of Worcester. It's believed Jessica Jones's killer drove 20 minutes or so through dense fog during the early morning hours of November 8, 1989, to dump Jessica's body inside a sleeping bag off of Chocolog Road near the intersection of Quaker Highway. Jessica's death is among a long list of young women in the 1980s and 90s from Worcester who lived troubled lives working the streets to make ends meet and support their addictions to wind up dead and dumped in the road, their young lives ending before they are even given a chance to find out if things could get better. Welcome back to Unsolved Worcester. I'm your host, Dan Yeager. Unsolved Worcester takes a deep dive every Tuesday into the unsolved murders and missing persons cases under investigation by the Worcester Police Department's Detective Unit, the Worcester County District Attorney's Office, and the Massachusetts State Police. Be sure to visit Unsolved Worcester on Facebook and Instagram, and listen to all episodes for free at unsolvedworcester.com and on your favorite podcast streaming platforms. Check out the video for this episode with exclusive aerial views and more on the Unsolved Worcester YouTube page. And don't forget to hit that subscribe button. Jessica Jones grew up in Worcester. Her last known address was her maternal grandparents' house on Richmond Avenue, a two-family home in a neighborhood tucked away between Pleasant Street and Salisbury Street on Worcester's west side. According to a 1992 report in the Telegram and Gazette, Jessica was taken in by her foster parents, Brian and Judy Stoll, after Jessica's mother, Janice Jones, died of a drug overdose in 1977. Jessica spent a year and a half in the custody of the Department of Youth Services after her mother died. She also went by the name of Jessica Stoll, sharing the same last name as her foster parents. She entered her teenage years. Jessica would soon follow in the footsteps of her mother, succumbing to a drug addiction and turning tricks in downtown Worcester. She was a pretty young girl with red hair. She was petite but was unafraid of the men she dealt with. Her foster mother told a reporter in 1992 that Jessica would sometimes try to take the money from men and jump out of their vehicles without performing sex. This risky business may have led to her death. When she wasn't working the streets, Jessica would often visit the mustard seed shelter on Merrick Street and its soup kitchen on Piedmont Street. At the Mustard Seed, she was known as Jessie and was one of the many young women in the 80s working the Worcester streets 
to be part of the social services center's community, getting a hot meal and a place to sleep. A vigil was held in her memory at the Mustard Seeds Chapel on Piedmont Street following Jessica's death. She was described by family members and social workers as someone who was loved and cared about. She was a generous person who believed in God. She was buried at St. John Cemetery on Cambridge Street in Worcester. The sleeping bag Jessica Jones's body was discovered in was soaked. The early morning rain and heavy fog had drenched it. Police believe Jessica's partially clothed body had been there less than 24 hours when it was found at the foot of the Route 146 southbound exit ramp along Chalkalog Road in Uxbridge. It's likely she had been killed somewhere else and discarded 20 miles away there that morning unseen, helped by the fog cover. An autopsy showed Jessica had died instantly from blunt force trauma, but she had also been stabbed several times. The day after Jessica was found, Uxbridge police set up an overnight roadblock along Chalkalog Road for six hours, stopping vehicles to ask drivers if they had seen anything out of the ordinary 24 hours earlier. The small police department was inundated with phone calls and leads in the days following and conducted several interviews in response. But none of the calls or interviews amounted to anything that would link someone to Jessica's murder. According to a TNG report, Jessica's foster brother saw her get into a blue van on the day before she was found dead. Her brother wrote down the license plate number of the van but it's likely he had written the plate number down incorrectly, as it was later traced to a tractor-trailer truck. But the van was seen later that same day by Jessica's aunt in the same area, and Jessica's family believed not being able to find the owner of the van left a gaping hole in the investigation into her murder. Coming up, a possible break in the case is held up by red tape as a prisoner is willing to come forward with information in exchange for charges being dropped. John LaJoy, a private investigator working in Worcester, launched his business in 1989, the same year Jessica Jones was found murdered in Uxbridge. LaJoy spent the early years in business working toward finding the truth of who killed Jessica. In late 1993, LaJoy was contacted by an informant on Cape Cod who was facing criminal charges in Barnstable County. By New Year's Day, 1996, the informant was locked up in the Barnstable House of Corrections on different charges. According to a report in the Telegram and Gazette, the informant was willing to provide a statement that would connect a suspect to Jessica's murder. He shared his story with LaJoy, who had hoped the informant would get the chance to testify before a grand jury. LaJoy told the TNG that the informant's story goes something like this. The informant didn't know who Jessica Jones or Jessica Stoll was, and he wasn't from the area. But he had read a story about her murder, and that her body had been found along Chocolog Road in Uxbridge. The name Chocolog is what got the informant's attention. The informant told LaJoy that on the night of Jessica's murder, November 8, 1989, a suspect told the informant that he had given a young girl the chocolate shuffle. Although the suspect never explicitly said he killed Jessica, the chocolate shuffle reference stuck with the informant. LaJoy was able to confirm other aspects of the informant's statement by matching information given to him by the Uxbridge Police Department, and he requested a review of the Massachusetts State Police case files. In early 1994, Jessica's father, Brian Stoll, signed a release form for the state to share the case files. 
including police reports and autopsy reports with LaJoy. Later that same year, the Secretary of State's office directed the Massachusetts State Police to release documents and photographs to LaJoy. But the Worcester County District Attorney, John Conti, argued that the files were under exemption under the public records law for an ongoing case. And the state police said it would set a bad precedent to release the documents to LaJoy. With the MSP's general counsel threatening to take it to Superior Court or State Supreme Judicial Court. Meanwhile, everyone on the law enforcement end of this, from the Uxbridge Police to the State Police to the DA's office, were all unwilling to broker a deal with LaJoy's informant on Cape Cod. Joy argued that if there's an opportunity to generate a new lead in a murder case, Wouldn't it be worth it to broker a deal with a minor criminal offense? But the DA's office wouldn't budge on a deal until they had a chance to review the evidence the informant was allegedly withholding. Because of the unwillingness to find some kind of middle ground between all parties, the witness's testimony was never heard and LaJoy was unable to review the state police files to determine whether his informant's information checked out. Jessica's killer's name may have been within reach, but the opportunity to find out the truth was bungled along the way. And now, 35 years later, the murder of Jessica Jones remains unsolved. Thank you for listening. I'm Dan Yeager. Don't miss another episode. Click the notification button to get alerts when new episodes of Unsolved Worcester drop. If you enjoyed listening to this episode, please consider giving us a five-star rating or clicking the like button on your YouTube videos. Anyone with information on the murder of Jessica Jones are asked to contact the Uxbridge Police Department at 508-278-7874 or send an anonymous text to 847-411. Write UPDTIP plus your message, or send an anonymous web-based message at tip411.com. Come back next time for Episode 4 of Unsolved Worcester Season 7 and the unsolved homicide of 23-year-old Champy Rivera in Worcester in July 2018. Be sure to catch up on all previous episodes at unsolvedworcester.com. Special thanks to the Worcester Public Library, the Worcester Police Department, the City of Worcester, and our sponsors for making this possible. Season 7 of Unsolved Worcester wouldn't be possible without the generous contributions of our fundraising campaign donors, especially Marsha, Jason, and Nicole. Information on Jessica's case was gathered from multiple resources, including the Worcester Telegram and Gazette. The Unsolved Worcester podcast music is provided by Tom LaBelzik of the Worcester Jazz Collective. This episode is written and produced by Pat Sargent. Drone footage provided by Ron Scott at Chasing Daylight Studio. Videography and editing by Colin Turner. This program is supported in part by a grant from the Worcester Arts Council and the National Endowment for the Arts. To find out more about how National Endowment for the Arts grants impact individuals and communities, visit www.arts.gov.